Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by RWJ Barnabas Health, New Jersey Sharing Network, the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, moving the region through air, land, rail, and sea. Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey. United Airlines. NJM Insurance Group, serving New Jersey's drivers, homeowners, and business owners for more than 100 years. The Healthcare Foundation of New Jersey, TD Bank, and by Fedway Associates, Inc. Promotional support provided by NorthJersey.com and Local IQ, part of the USA Today Network, and by New Jersey Monthly, the magazine of the Garden State, available at newsstands. This is One on One. I'm an equal American just like you are. The jobs of tomorrow are not the jobs of yesterday. Look at this. You got this? Here it is, man. Look at that. Life without dance is boring. <laughs> I don't care how good you are or how good you think you are, there is always something to learn. Do you enjoy talking politics? No. People call me because they feel nobody's paying attention. Our culture, I don't think, has ever been tested the way it's being tested right now. That's a good question. High five. Hi, I'm Steve Adubato. We're coming to you from East Main Media Studios in um, Little Falls, New Jersey. You know, uh, in our work in public broadcasting, particularly our series one-on-one, -on -one, we sit down with some pretty amazing people. And uh, sometimes when those people pass on, we decide to rebroadcast those programs. That's the case when it comes to James, Lips James Lipton, the extraordinary James Lipton, who died at uh, 93 years of age. He retired at 92, doing an extraordinary series called Inside the Actor's Studio. Uh, he was a Dean Emeritus, Actor's Studio Drama School at Pace University, um, Emmy Award-winning anchor, Critics' Choice anchor, the late James Lipton. So back in June 2016, I sat down with Mr. Lipton. Amazing. And by the way, I'm joined in the studio by Nicole Swinerton, who, um, let me just ask you, I've been in this business for obviously a very long time. Hopefully I'll be in as long as Lipton was. What did you take from that interview that we're about to see? It's an incredible interview, and James Lipton is a, a real icon in the business. I think my, my favorite part of the interview is how much you can tell he loves his craft, but more than that, he wants to uh, teach the next generation, and he wants to train young actors. And I think that's just a, a beautiful way to um, show off the love of your craft. The other thing you're going to see in this Lipton interview that we actually taped in the WNET Tisch Studios over in Lincoln Center, Lipton insisted, I don't know if you remember this, but Lipton insisted on setting it up the way he does his show. Now, we do our show out of the WNET studio in New York the way we do the show. He wanted it. He had his table in front of him. He had his blue cards. The blue cards get you? Yeah, that was great. Cool to see that on TV. So he has his own blue cards. He also makes it clear in this interview you're about to see. <clears throat> no pre-interviews. Nicole and our team of great producers do pre-interviews. I get the notes, and then I prepare for the interview. With James Lipton, he does all his research. You'll see him talk about this. There are no pre-interviews with the guests. He finds out everything for the first time. I learned more about interviewing in that half hour with James Lipton than I've ever learned before. It has become one of my top three all-time interviews other than uh, the interview I did with the late Governor Mario Cuomo um, and a couple of others. I'm not going to go into that, but I'll just say this. This is a conversation that's powerful, compelling, honest, genuine. You also see a section, if you know James Lipton, when he did those great interviews at, uh, inside the actor's studio where he would ask guests, by the way, who was his favorite guest that, he, that we featured in this one? Uh, Bradley Cooper. He talks about what a great cycle that was for him. Yeah, and there's a Robert De Niro connection, so you can't lose out there. In those great interviews that he did for so many years, he would ask a series of very powerful, probing questions that I was about to ask him. Well, he turned around and asked me those questions, and I was not prepared. So he passed at 93. He gave so much to this industry. A teacher, educator, scholar, and broadcaster the late, great James Lipton. Public television is honored to welcome Mr. James Lipton, a Critics' Choice and Emmy Award winning creator, writer, host of Inside the Actors Studio and, and Dean Emeritus, uh, Actors Studio Drama School at Pace 
University, uh, let me welcome you on behalf of everyone in the world of public broadcasting. Mr. Lipton. Thank you very much. I'm very glad to be here. Um, I need to ask you, first of all, thank you for bringing this blue card, which uh, <laughs> it doesn't make it official. I'm naked without it. Yeah, well, thank you. Um, I've often, first of all, the idea that you are here is important to all of us and more importantly, important to our audience. The key or the keys to this series, which has been on the air for how long? We are in our 23rd season. Why has it worked, Mr. Lipton? It's worked for two odd reasons. Uh, when, we, when I was the dean of the Actors Studio Drama School, I created it with my colleagues at the Actors Studio. And when we began it, uh, we knew that we had teachers. All of our teachers are, are life members of the Actors Studio. We knew that it would be a very important graduate school. It gives an MFA. And uh, we were, we, we had teachers from the, from, uh, from the studio, people who could give us 30 weeks, people who could give us six Fridays and so forth. I had one opening and um, that opening was for those people who couldn't give us six weeks of teaching, but who were members of the studio, colleagues of ours, people from mm -hmm. the industry with whom we'd worked and whom we wanted to come and teach our students. It is a master class. And uh, so uh, I sent a letter out to the uh, community from which I'd come. And uh, I said, uh, these people are liable to say something important. Uh, and television is the only way to re mm. preserve it forever. And Bravo, to its eternal credit, I believe, uh, responded. You pitched the idea. Yes, I pitched the idea of both the school and the uh, television program to the studio and to the television industry. But would you like to know a wonderful secret? Sure. It links us forever with PBS. When we created the school, which was my idea, and I worked with Norman Mailer and uh, Paul Newman and Ellen Burstyn. I mean, we had a great committee that put the school together. We asked Charlie Rose if we could come on and announce the fact that the Actors Studio for the first time in then 47 years was going to create a degree-granting program. Charlie invited us on the show, and the, there was a flood of applications. Within uh, three years, we were the largest graduate drama school in America, and we owe it to Charlie. And public television. And public you, television. You, that's announced, where we on, you that, announced on public television. That's where we went. We, knew, we were smart. We knew where to go. <sighs> you have done... So many extraordinary interviews. For years and years and years, for decades, <laughs> yes. I was asked, what guest in the whole world do you want the most? You know what my answer was? Go ahead. The night that one of our graduated students has achieved so much that he comes back to our stage and sits next to me as my guest, and Bradley was the one. What was that like for you, Mr. Lipton, when that moment happened and Robert De Niro walked out and your student Bradley Cooper is there. What yeah, was it like? Th that, that moment was from the 250th episode when he came back. But the first time that he came as a guest, as my guest, as, as me sitting with you. Sure. We looked at each other and we burst into tears and we had to stop and recover ourselves before we could go on with the show. And he cried all through the show. He kept bursting into tears. He's a wonderful man. And a, as we all know now, is a brilliant actor. But I auditioned him. If I if I'd turned him down... He would have stayed at Georgetown and become a diplomat. <laughs> you know, it's so and a great one. I I'm sure. But as you talk about this, what strikes me is the personal human connection that you feel to your students. Talk about it. Well, when I, I, I woke up one morning, 1994, with an idea in my head a complete idea, everything, down to the curriculum, down to the credits, down to the teachers. And I went to uh, Jonathan Fanton, who was then the president of the New School for Social Research, where we began. And I said to him, what if I could uh, uh, persuade the studio to, for the first time in 47 years, teach a graduate degree granting program and he said where's the pen and when do I sign and that's when those people worked with me and that's when Charlie Rose invited us on and that's how it started 
So the school, I, 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 I was busy then writing my third musical for Broadway. Uh, I, and I started to step aside. My colleagues at the studio said, you can't. You have yeah. to start this. You have to launch it. I said, OK, I'll do it for a year. I did it for 10 years. I was its dean. And uh, that school, I guess if I have a letter to the world, that school is it. And those students, I go to the repertory season each year when the graduating students show their wares. And I sit there in such awe and with such pride and with the deepest feeling, it is, I suppose, that's my letter to the world. You know, often when I sit in this seat, in this studio, yeah. at the Tisch, you know, WNET studio here in Lincoln Center, I often feel um, uh, blessed is a, is a word that's overused by a lot of people, but I do feel blessed. I feel incredibly fortunate, and this is a, uh, one of the reasons for it, to be able to talk to people and, more importantly, listen to people. Like that's, you? That's the key. How often do you feel like that? How often? Every time I walk on that stage. Look, if, if when we started this whole thing inside the actor's studio, uh, somebody had put a gun to my head and said, I'm going to pull the trigger unless you predict that in 22 years, and still going strong, you will be viewed in 94 million homes in America on Bravo and 125 countries around the world. 125 countries around the world. That is correct. 94 million homes. That is correct. You will, you will have, the show will have 18 Emmy nominations making Inside the Actor's Studio the fifth most nominated show in the history of broadcast television. You will, the show will receive an Emmy Award for Outstanding Informational Series. You personally will receive the Critics' Choice Award for Best Host. 2015. Yes, that's correct. If, you, if somebody had said that to be predicted or, or I pulled the trigger, I would have said, pull the trigger, I'm a dead man. I saw none of it coming. None of it. Not only that, but I made two vows to myself. One, that we would not deal in gossip, we would deal in craft, which of course I thought might make us dry and off the air in, in a year. And the other, that there would be no pre-interview. It is the only show of its kind that I know of where there's no pre-interview, none. That's why I do the blue cards. I spend. For each show, I spend two weeks at least, sometimes three or four, 12 hours a day, seven days a week, preparing those blue cards myself. Explain that. My Explain that. For folks who understand, I want to really understand what Mr. Lichtman is saying. Um, and I'll disclose in, in our world, um, our, our producers do pre-interviews. That's and correct. I will look Everybody at the notes. I will look at the notes, and, and then I will decide what I want to do. But I probably couldn't do that. You're probably much smarter than I am. No. I probably would, would, would fail at that. That's not the case. You do all your research. You do it. I'm alone in my study, and I'm there for two weeks or three or four, watching every foot of film and, and, uh, and working on the blue cards, and then I churn them out, and then we go on stage. What I've compared it to and what the guests have sometimes compared it to is a kind of circus ring where there's a high wire with no net. We're out there for four or five hours. It's a master class for, for our graduate students, and we're up there on that net, with, on that high wire, with no net. And, uh, and, and that's the way the show works. I did that with no pre-interview. I figured that would force us into a conversation. And we would have to do what you said a few minutes ago, which is the key to it all. We'd have to listen to each other, which is what actors do when they're acting well. And if the show has any secret, that's it. They don't know what's coming next. I don't know what's coming next. And that's the thrill of it. And I go on that stage with them, and you know the people that I go on the stage with. It isn't, their, it isn't their celebrity that excites me. It's what might happen between us. And when things go awry, and all those 400 blue cards avail me nothing because they've gone off in a brand new direction, I'm the happiest man in New York. As you say that, Mr. Lippin, what, so, what strikes me is all that preparation, and so many people who want to go into this business and think it's about the list of questions you have that makes a great interview, you just proved that is not the case. Oh, no. The questions are meant to evoke an answer, and the answer is what is everything. I, I actually am see, I edit the show myself with my colleagues. Uh, Jeff Wirtz is the actual editor, the physical editor, but I do the, the, uh, the, the creative editing, and I edit myself out of that show. I'm on the screen less than any host in television, I think, for good reason, because there are people are on that stage are, are saying things that really matter, and they're the reason that the people tune in all over the world. 125 countries. That's not a joke. When you interviewed Robin Williams, when you were with Robin Williams, oh. what was it? Go ahead. Well, 
Robin, he came out on the stage and he suddenly began to dance around and carry on. And it was finally, after a, quite a length of time, I raised my hand, it was about seven or eight minutes. I raised my hand, he said, what do you want? I said, I want to ask a question. He was on his own, for, and then that, that went on for, it was, a, it was our first two hour show, and we were, in the, we were in that theater on the stage for five hours that night, and he, every moment of it was sheer genius. The most famous moment on our show, yes. without question, was the pink pashmina that he took from a young woman in the first row, and he did about eight minutes on the pink pashmina, changing characters with it, turning into different people, and producing humor that was the equal of anything that anybody could see on television that year. Genius, genius. Speaking of genius, I, I'm almost embarrassed to do this. Can I, uh, the questions, the genius questions? All right, I, I have to do it. I don't have to, I choose to. Your questions, not mine. Can I flip the table? Can yeah. I turn the tables? Let me ask you a question. If I answer them, will you answer them? Oh boy. No, I can't. I can't. I can't. I can't do it because I, I, I'm no good at this. The whole. It, Don't worry about it. We'll do. We'll, What's your favorite word? Honor. What's your least favorite word? The N word. No matter who says it, and no matter what its purpose may seem to be these days, it is a word that was meant to injure, and no context makes it okay. What is the sound or noise you love? Silence the most underestimated sound in the world. The sound of noise you hate. The din that passes for joy in restaurants and public places when people scream at each other or they think they're not having a good time. What profession, other than what you're doing today, would you like to attempt? I would like to be a premier danseur, but with this proviso, never old and never injured. Um, what profession would you not like to do, Mr. Lipton? That's easy. Executioner. And finally, if heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? See, Jim, you were wrong. I exist, but you may come in anyway. <laughs> um, this is public broadcasting. Um, I'm afraid to ask you if uh, your favorite, can I do the favorite curse word? No. You can. I can? You can ask me mine. I hear my... our president somewhere in the building. Can I ask him a favorite? We'll bleep it, your favorite? No, my, mine is not, you won't have to bleep it. Favorite curse word? It's not, it's, it's, it's not obscene, and it's not, not scatological. It's profane. You can tell when I'm really upset. The first words out of my mouth are Jesus Christ. Mm. And that is objectionable to many people, and I apologize right mm. here and now for saying it. But nevertheless, that's my favorite curse I know that comes out because it comes out before I can stop it. What turns on, what turns off? What turns me on is words, not mine. But... I think that words, in the, especially in the English language, are our most precious natural resource. What turns you off? Humiliation, especially toward a defenseless child. Yeah. Uh, do you mind if I tell people James Lipton? Mind? <laughs> well, I'm in your debt. Inside, inside. That's my memoir, published a few years ago. And that's my other letter to the world. That's an exaltation of larks. A book about collective nouns like a pride of lions and a gaggle of geese and Thank all you. the real ones that I found and the ones I made up. Mr. Lipton, my producers who talk to me in my ear, you go without a net. My producers are insisting I ask the question. You want me to do this? Try. They want me to answer. You want me to answer the questions? Try it. Go ahead. Oh, that's wonderful. I'm going to try. I've, I've always been uncomfortable with this. Go ahead. What's your favorite word? Love. What's your least favorite word? Hate. What turns you on? My wife. What turns you off? Oh, boy. <laughs> My first answer, I'm not going with. I got to go with the first. No, you don't. Um, um, bullying. What sound or noise do you love? Uh, Luther Vandross. <laughs> I always remember Ellen Burstyn's answer to that. It was... Bird song in the morning and Rachmaninoff at night. What sound or noise do you hate? Yelling in our house. What is your favorite curse word? 
not doing a uh, favorite curse word. Um, it is the, uh, it's that word. It's the F the, word. Yes, the F word. Yeah, it's uh, almost everybody's favorite. And then everyone on our staff knows, so I'm sorry. <laughs> what profession other than your own would you like to attempt? Oh, I would always love to have played center field for the only baseball team that matters, the New York Yankees. And what profession would you not like to participate in? Anything that involves working with your hands. Finally, if heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? I know you tried your best, Steve. Not bad at all. Thank you, Mr. Lippin. Very good answers. It's been an honor to have you with us. An honor to be here. Thank you very much. Okay. I'm so indebted to PBS. We're indebted to you. That's it, folks. We'll see you next time. So that's why that interview is so special. Um, again, James Lipton passed on March 2nd, 2020, but I will never forget that interview, particularly, <laughs> I didn't, you think you know what to expect when you're interviewing someone, but when they turn the tables on you and they start asking you questions, uh, particularly the probing questions that James Lipton asked me, I, I frankly was not ready, Nicole. I can't imagine what you must have felt like. Would you have changed any of your answers a couple years later? Uh, I don't think so. That's good. You know, I, I, I <laughs> look, when he asked, what did, he, cause I answered, what did I answer Luther Vandross to? It was a question, help me on this. Yeah, your favorite sound, was it? Yeah, <laughs> he said it was silence. And for me, it was Luther Vandross because I, I made the connection between my wife and I, first time we heard him um, perform at the New Jersey Performing Arts Center. But the thing about Lipton, as I think back on it, the art of conversation. I'm a student of conversation. Think about it, study it, make mistakes all the time in it. Lipton has this and had this extraordinary ability to get you to feel that it wasn't a television interview, that you're actually having a conversation. And he's an exceptional listener. Did that stand out for you? Absolutely, and I, I find it very interesting um, as a producer myself to see the different styles of interviewing and to see how you can go question to question to question and still come up with an amazing conversation, or there's a completely different way of doing it, and it's a lot more of a, um, a natural conversation. There's just many different styles of it, and he showed a really great one. Isn't it interesting, and we said before that Lipton doesn't do pre-interviews. Nicole is a part of a team, or a 10-person team, and a lot of our producers do pre-interviews. And so I'll get those notes. And I said this earlier. Was it interesting for you to see him be the producer, the host, the researcher with those blue cards? He had no idea what he was going to get back. And he went wherever he chose to go based on what was said. Absolutely. It, that was really fascinating. I actually didn't know that any host of any show didn't do pre-interviews, have their producers do pre-interviews. So I thought that was um, really cool to hear that he does all of that himself. And he's, what do you say, he spends 12 hours a day for weeks working yes, on this? Yes, he'll be in his office. That's impressive. Yeah, I want to assure everyone I do not spend 12 hours, <laughs> as you may be able to tell from my interviews. Uh, no, but I, I, again, this is the opposite. We have 30 seconds left. Larry King used to say, Larry King wrote a book in, 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 in about interviewing, and he said, I never read the book. I know nothing about the guests, and I find everything out for the first time. And I thought, wow, that's lazy. <laughs> Meaning, I understand that there's something in between Lipton and Larry King, but I'll say this. I said it before, I'll say it again. I learned more about, forget about broadcasting, just about human communication, interaction, engaging other people, listening, and really creating something that makes a difference in people's lives. And that's what James Lipton did for us. So that's it for this very special edition of One on One. Uh, uh, we call it Gone But Not Forgotten when we rebroadcast interviews with people who may not be here anymore but had a lasting impact. Um, James Lipton, extraordinary, powerful. Thanks for joining us. Very special edition of One on One. I'm Steve Adubato. See you next time. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation. Funding has been provided by RWJ Barnabas Health, New Jersey Sharing Network, the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, United Airlines, NJM Insurance Group, the Healthcare Foundation of New Jersey, TD Bank, and by Fedway Associates, Inc.
Promotional support provided by NorthJersey.com and Local IQ, and by New Jersey Monthly. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. You may not have heard of TAVR. Raj and Sandhya have. It's the minimally invasive alternative to open heart valve replacement. RWJ Barnabas Health is New Jersey's leading TAVR provider, and we continue to perfect it. Patients are often back to their lives in just a few days. Innovative valve replacement surgery. Because you can't be replaced. RWJ Barnabas Health. Let's be healthy together.